Hello and welcome to another episode of Casual Friday. I'm here with the duck. As always, the show is brought to you by Woo. Links available in the description below. There's currently a trading competition going on. There's a volume component, ROI component. Also, as we know, there's a kind of shittiest trader component. <laughs> They'll send you some garbage if your returns are particularly bad, which is quite fun, quite entertaining. Uh, maybe it's not worth competing in that one because I've got that one on lock. But nonetheless, a lot of good stuff going on there. Be sure to check it out. Uh, in general, I think Woo's changed a lot in the positive direction since we've started working with them. It's obviously all of our doing. Oh, um, yeah, entirely. A hundred percent, especially you, you know, with, with how engaged you are. Um, but jokes aside, as far as, you know, some of the earlier concerns with centralization and liquidity provision, those have markedly improved. And I mean, let's hope that keeps moving in that direction. But shills aside, uh, the market's been red hot. So let's talk about things. I've got the monthly chart open at the moment, Don. Nine mm -hmm. days left until the monthly close. Looks like four green monthlies in a row. And that's that's a lot. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed. That that's a pretty, pretty large number. Um, and as far as levels and things like that go, uh, I still think that the monthly cluster is probably the most semi-relevant thing. I know you've sort of gone back and forth as to whether this is a level at all or not, sort of between mm -hmm. 44 and 47, uh, because setup wise, once we reclaim the monthly range low at 35, 37, logically speaking, you're expecting price to eventually make its way uh, to the range high at 58, 60 or whatever. Uh, but I think when you get a really strong trend like this, if you're, if you're looking for anything technical, uh, levels that would ordinarily be uh, maybe less than ideal become, uh, you know, more firm than they would be uh, simply because all the lower levels are so fucking far away. Uh, you, you need something to to ground you. So that's what I've got on the monthly. Before the full technical stuff, and, and we will talk about it, I wanted to ask a slightly different question. Uh, we will do like a full year, you know, year review 2024 projections thing next week. Uh, so that'll be fun. But in general, kind of looking at this thing, uh, what would for you be the most surprising outcome? Because obviously there's like a lot coming up, right? Like the market's been red hot just momentum wise and how much we've moved. We've also got a, you know, the culmination of a massive catalyst uh, that's been in our flows and in our minds for the last six months and since 24K, uh, as well as just kind of new slate, new year type of stuff coming up. So, so it's all a pretty big deal. With all of that in mind, what would be for you the most surprising outcome where, you know, however the next one, you know, few weeks or month or so transpire uh, with all these headlines coming to a close in one way or another, what kind of price action would make you think, holy shit, was I fucking wrong about how, how this would resolve? I mean, I, I'd be most surprised if uh, after the ETF um, announcement, we wouldn't dump like that be the biggest upset to me. Upset, um, <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, fucking think, bear tard. <laughs> like, like if it's if it's a negative outcome, obviously we're gonna dump, right? right. But even if it's a positive outcome, I think uh, price is gonna go lower, um, just based on how how high we rallied. Like that would be surprising if we just went up and then stayed up. Um, now I could be completely wrong on that, um, but for me personally, that just be very surprising. I think, like, I think we've been we've been pricing this thing in for so long, um, and so telegraphed that uh, I don't know, just would be surprising. So generally, if we went into January without moving much, that'd be a big surprise, and if we didn't dump, that'd also be a big surprise. So those are the the two. So I think volatility is coming and I think it's going to be to the downside in January. But what we do before then is quite hard to say. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I, I, the time horizon, the time component of that is fairly self-explanatory. You know, with the actual news event coming, uh, it's around that window, maybe slightly before, maybe slightly after. Uh, but in that window is sort of highest risk in general with these really telegraphed events. Um, I, I personally think it might skew towards either very shortly before when it's kind of quote unquote confirmed uh, with insider flows one way or another, or on the pump after, uh, you know, I can understand if someone doesn't want to sell a ton of size without seeing the actual headline, and maybe that reaction is worth waiting for. But I, I would also be surprised if there's no risk shedding, even if as we approach the sort of end of the holiday season and the week of announcements, because it's pretty much back to back, right? It's like Christmas, New Year, and then bam, it's expected like in the first, what, three, five days of January, the first week in any case, man, I'd be really surprised if that doesn't, it is not at least a precursor to volatility. I share your view that, and again, this this could age embarrassingly wrong, but you know, it's just a market, it's just a trade who, who gives a shit. Um, but if essentially we have a mega ETF rally for half a year, the news itself is a buy the news event 
and then the flows after the event are all are all continue to be bullish and we just i mean what does the chart even look like at that point <laughs> uh, it, it would just have to be like you know a, a move from 26k to all-time high breakout and then maybe it pulls back from like 80 to 50 <laughs> i don't even know like it, 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 it's a lot man it's a lot is yeah. is what i'm getting at so i think that's why probabilistically expecting at least some sort of cool down ranging pullback thing makes sense in january but i mean god knows at this point because i didn't yeah. expect mid i mean you can find old casual friday episodes where i was bare laughing being like yeah you know like 35 37 40 uh without all the credit expansion and all the inflows etc that's going to be a hard area to get through and now we're like repeatedly flirting with 50 so mm. anything is possible it turns out yeah i think in general like even like there's there's a few scenarios in my in my head and let's say like the the halving um uh, and the the etf can kind of like make this thing bullish even if that is the case i think the news are going to be a set of the news event and then you you might just wick right like maybe maybe like we wick to the upside on the etf announcement towards like whatever uh 45 46 47 maybe 48 something like that and then i could see like a 10 20 30 percent weekly wick to the downside um that gets basically eaten up and then you go up like that is the most bullish thing that i could see happen um i think that's still quite unlikely just based on the fact that it's gonna take a while uh, until the etf really kicks in uh, the only argument, the, the counter argument I could make to that is basically that it looks a little bit dumb for all of these, for all of these um, companies, whatever, BlackRock, all of those, uh, if they announce an ETF and then Bitcoin just disappears, right? So you could make an argument that they're going to just buy a, a bunch, basically, um, to make this thing not look completely like a joke. Uh, I, I've, and I don't necessarily hate that that argument so there's there's a few ways to to skin the cat um in this one i just think the most likely one is um at least an impulse to the downside that maybe gets bought up maybe not who knows at that point but we'll see very soon actually it's very exciting. dude yeah it's like around the corner and to be clear we don't endorse any animal cruelty on the show so don's comments about skinning cats are purely metaphorical and if you hear any weird meows in the background of his audio it's got nothing to do with his previous mm. comments Exactly. Um, <laughs> on, on the pullback front, so you and I from experience and anyone can just look at a chart, even during like mega manic uptrends, which aren't narrative based and sort of full fledged bull market type of price action, uh, 20 to 40 percent pullbacks in BTC uh, have been common in the past. Mm -hmm. Do you think so, so if we sort of look at where that might land or happen uh, from a purely technical point of view? Uh, we are monthly time frame enjoyers in general. Um, when you, when you talk about larger pullbacks, are there any levels before basically thirty something that you think might be interesting if the market's really bullish? Or are you like, okay, listen, we've had the ETF for so long, we've ran into it for so hard, you, you know, we ran into it so hard and so much, uh, and finally we get the news event. We're going to get a proper pullback and proper means thirty something. Is is there a way out of that basically? I mean, if it just goes sideways, which I think is very, very unlikely. Like, if we just start ranging um, at like forty-ish for a while, I think mm -hmm. that would make the chart look incredibly bullish, and in general, just kind of absorb some of that kind of sell the news flow that we're gonna get. Like, I'm, I'm certain that there's gonna be quite a bit of of selling on that news. It's just a question of whether that's gonna be enough or not. And I think it will, just based on how high prices. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe it goes sideways. Maybe it just pulls back and then goes sideways a little bit. Um, I could see all of that happen. Um, but in terms of like 20 to 40% pullback, like let's say we run hard on the ETF announcement, which is possible, right? Like sure. Let's say it runs to 50K. Um, a 30, 40% pullback would put it like to 32K range low. Um, and that would be a nice area to buy, I think. So yeah. like I... It doesn't have to go that low if it runs high, right? Like the higher it runs, um, the the more unrealistic the low targets get, right? So, for example, like if we run to 60K before the ETF, um, <laughs> you wouldn't expect it to pull back straight to 30K. Like at that point, that's ridiculous, that's right? Called at the that halving. point, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At that point, you would more likely kind of expect it to pull back like if it ran to 60k which i don't think will happen but if it did uh, you'd expect it to pull back to like 40 
Um, and then obviously the higher it goes, the the higher that level has to be. Yeah. I, something that I see people do a lot is basically they have this magic pullback level and they're like, I want to buy at this price point. And then the price rallies and they just keep that level in place. And at some point, it's just like, that's not going to happen anymore, right? Like if you're, if you're targeting 16K, um, so you're like, oh, the ETF um, is going to come and you're going to get a dump. And I've been wanting to buy 16 or 14K um, <laughs> since the beginning of this year. Respectfully so... wanting to buy, yes. <laughs> yeah. <And> congratulations. <laughs> like, Sorry, that's I, just... I won't go there. I can't. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but like, that's, that's just unrealistic. That's not going to happen, right? Like unless something catastrophically goes wrong, which at this point, I think we've had enough stuff go catastrophically wrong um i i don't really see any any catastrophic risk in the system so i don't think we're we're going back to 14 16k i think that right. ship has sailed um and the higher we go the less likely it is that we go to 20 and then if we go even higher the the higher likelihood that 25k holds and so on so you have to kind of move up your your pullback levels that you find interesting to buy um, for me right now, like 30-ish around that seems realistic still. Um, but that's obviously going to change. Like if we get a massive run into the ETF announcement uh, and then after the ETF announcement, um, I would never target anything for like, especially for a trend like this, that is larger than 40% of a pullback. Um, because if it gets larger than 40%, um, it's not necessarily a pullback anymore. Um so that's kind of like the the maximum and then you just kind of like look look how far it goes and see see like anything between like you said 20 to 40 percent is interesting um just you just have to kind of adjust the numbers upwards if you want to be buying the dip yeah basically apply that rough sort of discount band to whatever the price is as opposed exactly. to marrying the level itself I, th yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense um also, another sort of narrative point that might be interesting to talk about is there's been a lot of commentary about how, uh, oh my God, like look at this price action in 2023 and that's without the ETF or the halving or this. Now just imagine what 2024 <laughs> is going to be like. I, I don't necessarily uh, think that's a great way of looking at flows, right? Because uh, yeah. markets by their nature are sort of forward looking and th th their entire sort of purpose or a large part of their purpose is to uh, price in and discount a lot of these future events uh, into the current price, and a lot of this twenty, a lot of these twenty twenty four narratives, uh, ETF especially, uh, but even like halving related stuff, or even the combination ETF plus halving, you'd be very hard pressed, I think, to argue that none of that. So there's some arbitrary, basically, kick in point. Like, you know, when the calendar rolls over to January 1st, then all the 2024 narratives apply or whatever weird yeah. version of that. Like, they've clearly, like, they've played a part in this rally. Because if you, if you want to, the, the simplest form of this argument is the following. If you think that the ETF uh, hasn't been priced in and that it's a 2024 thing, then you'd have to come up with an entirely different description and reasoning behind this rally because technically we don't have a spot ETF yet. Like, it's just yeah. that simple, right? It's like, well, 2024 is the year of the ETF. We've gone up, but we don't have an ETF. Therefore, the market couldn't have gone up because of an ETF. And it's like, that's insane. So what we can infer from that is that things that haven't kicked in yet still get sort of priced in. And so as a result, if you're then extending that logic to 2024 things, you have to at the same time argue that the ETF hasn't been priced in at all, which is absurd. So the reasonable conclusion is that a lot of the 2024, oh my God, I can't wait for this kind of stuff, it's got to be increasingly priced in over time or certainly as the market goes up. I know I fucking made that really confusing or whatever, but basically it, it, it's not like these news events are super calendar sensitive or time sensitive or there's some sort of switch where it's like, okay, well now we have an ETF, the ETF buying is going to start. Or like now we have the halving, now the halving, is, the halving buying is going to start. Uh, these things get discounted in advance. Um, yeah. And I think we've seen a fair chunk of them is my personal view. I mean, I can just speak from personal experience, right? Like, Don't I talk about Litcoin, this... I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I mean, I literally bought 25K because of the ETF, right? Like, it's it's not like this is like completely made up shit where you're like, oh, yeah, um, it's only going to come in uh, once it's actually confirmed. Because like, obviously, like I was sitting there and I was making the whole bullish argument at 25 because it was like, or like 26, because I was like, 
uh, this is just going to be a bullish catalyst, so I'm going to buy. So I repriced this thing personally. I mean, obviously, it didn't push price. <laughs> <up or laughs> Fucking <anything>. legend. <laughs> um, but, but like, I was part of that repricing. Yes. Right? Like, and anyone that says anything else, like, it's just completely delusional, I think. Now, obviously, and this is the other side of that coin, um, what I see a lot of people kind of do is basically, like, they say the market is the market and the news don't matter. Like, I just need to look at the chart, whatever. And that is also wrong, um, in my opinion, because like oftentimes you get just news that you cannot price in, right? Like if something happens that, I mean, no one knows is going to happen, obviously it cannot be priced in before, right? So anyone that says like, hey, you just need to look at the market and I'll give you the news. Oh, that's God. bullshit. I hate that. It's completely dumb because it really depends, right? Like obviously from 25 to now, like, the news is a little bit priced in just based on the fact that everyone knew the news was coming in six months, right? Like, it's like, if someone tells you like, hey, the price is going to go up in six months, almost guaranteed, you're going to buy, right? Um, but if someone tells you like, hey, um, like, or like, if no one tells you that that's going <laughs> to come, and then it comes, and then the price goes up, like, it's a completely different yes. dynamic, right? So I, I, I hate this kind of argument where people are like, oh, just need to look at the price because the news are, is in the price, not true. But also, I hate the other way um, that we just discussed, which is basically people are like, oh, it's not priced in. Obviously, it's priced in. Like, this, like or like... This is Don's radical centrism. You know, both sides are bad. I'm never taking a position. Use my <laughs> ref link. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, usually, usually, and this is something that happens a lot in life, right? Like, the, some sort of the, the middle of the two dumbest arguments is somewhere at least in the right ballpark no right? i can't agree with that you've got to trade the range you know the extremes <laughs> only don't diddle in the middle don come on you've got to apply your trading philosophy to, to life as well um no I, I think those are all really good points and again one way that i like to argue in general is to point out like absurd examples uh, of what would be true if you take an assumption to be true uh, in, in the example that you used uh, if you view sort of the pricing of news event events that way You'd essentially have a conversation where someone says, hey, there's a halving, uh, sorry, there's an ETF coming in six months. That's going to be really bullish. And then your response would be, oh, okay, I'll buy it in six months then. <laughs> 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 yes. And that's just like not how it works, right? Nope. Um, or maybe it is. We'll find out. Like, again, the counter argument, this, this sounds very sort of pat on the back, lol, everyone's so dumb. It's not like that at all. It could be completely wrong. And momentum, liquidity, and flows are fucking very complicated things that can change on a dime. I think one of the stronger counter arguments is essentially that even if the ETF approval itself is decently priced in, uh, the flow, the, the real flows that come as a result of that product coming to the market uh, cannot be priced in because the product doesn't exist yet. Uh, that, that's probably yeah. the strongest counter argument if you're going to uh, make that point. But I still think there's got to be a, a, not that there's got to be, but there's likely to be a, a delay between those two things. And they're two different groups. Group one is like speculative, uh, way ahead of time, the price impact of an ETF product eventually reaching the market uh, hasn't been, you know, is, isn't reflected in the price. And so just like the Don style speculation at 25, I'm going to bet on that. That's group one. And then group two, I think is a different group just saying once this product exists and you can passively allocate to it and diversify and, you know, it sort of restores over time the reputation of Bitcoin and crypto post FTX, etc. I think that's a second group. And I think those two flows are different in terms of execution and also just in terms of time and how they apply to the market. 100% um, yeah. agree with that. So like, but we'll see, right? That, that's the great yeah. thing about markets. We'll find out. But thing is, Don, when you say like, just look at the chart or whatever, uh, <laughs> it always also leads to quite funny examples. It's like, no, bro, listen, I know my altcoin got raided in an FBI secret raid that no one knew about, but there was a triple RSI bearish divergence <laughs> that I guess yeah, yeah. the feds were painting <laughs> as like an insider signal to, to whales to sell or some shit. Like the, the assumptions you have to make to, to believe any sort of either either extreme version of efficient or inefficient markets hypothesis it leads you to such silly places uh, it's probably just not a, a particularly good way to start um i no, I, dude, I think you can consciously make that argument like hey look uh, i can only look at the chart <laughs> and i don't care about news i don't care about flows i'm just super agnostic my system just looks at you know the four corners of the chart and that's it uh, i think you can make that point and then that that's kind of a concession that your system has a specific scope and it only focuses on ABC and ignores everything else. But to say that because your system ignores everything else that it doesn't matter, entirely different claim and one that I don't think is particularly well supported. Yeah.
yeah well said i agree great uh, let's have the show then <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's gonna it's gonna be wild this this one thing like because it's either gonna be like a lot of expectations shattered especially i think a lot of people don't kind of account for the fact that it's gonna take a while for the etfs to start so they're gonna be like okay we have the announcement where's the flow and they're going to be shocked that it's just not there yet. Um, or it's just a bunch of people basically. And this is also an argument that you can make. It's basically that only we, as in the crypto people, know about this ETF coming, right? But I would not necessarily agree with that because it's all over Bloomberg. It's all over It's all over the news, really, right? Like we've been, like at least in the finance news cycle, this has been all over the place. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure if that's accurate, but you could argue that a bunch of people basically just don't know yet and they're going to rush in. And that's basically the only thing in my mind that could hold the price up at that point. Like you get the news announcement, you get a little bit of buying. Uh, I think the in, like the people that are in crypto already, um, I mean, you would have to have been like a little bit, um, I don't know. Like it's a little bit dumb if you didn't buy the ETF um, if you heard about it like six months ago. Um, and um, you're now sitting there and buying just because it's it's getting announced, right? Like that seems a little bit rid ridiculous. So I think like everyone that wanted to buy uh, on the crypto side of things has been. Uh, it's just a question of um, how much new flows from the news are we getting uh, yes. from outside capital. I think it's going to be limited, um, but as in limited in in relation to what has been bought and what what can be distributed by people that are just sharp, right? Like you're like, okay, this news was six months telegraphed. Uh, I can just buy uh, and then sell this to people two times higher. That seems like a pretty good deal um, just in general, right? I think a lot of people took on more risks than they are willing to carry over. Um, and they're going to shed that risk into people that are willing to buy after after the ETF. So I don't know. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be fun to watch. Uh, and it's soon, if, man. If nothing it's else. soon. Yeah. So that's one of the bigger events. Um, reminds me a little bit of the 2017. Um, CME. Yeah. CME launch. Yeah, I'm uh, glad where, that went well. <laughs> oh, yeah. People were, people were so, so happy to see that come. And they were like, this is going to change it. Uh, this one, in my opinion, is much, much more significant. I was back then shit talking uh, the CME launch. Uh, I'm not shit talking the ETF launch as much um, because that is actually just good flow. Um, but it does remind me a little bit of it, like the same kind of price action, the same kind of um, people going going nuts over Mate, it. You can I even look at more recent history, the Coinbase IPO. Oh, yeah, that was fun, too. Yeah. I mean, good God, was that one-sided in terms of expectations. Like, oh, no, it won't take away from BTC flows. No, it's not a sell the news event. This is like, you know, all sorts of arguments on all kinds of podcasts being made as to uh, how that's going to be different, essentially. And yeah. lo and behold, uh, different it was not. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. At this point, we're just so I'm so tired of the teasing and edging, you know, and I'm not, oh, I normally yeah. don't grow tired of that type of stuff. But in this rare instance, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it fucking put me out of my misery already, you know, oh, give, yeah. give me something else. Um, and also, I think you made a very good point of sort of bringing up the crypto native versus tradfi by the news type of crowds. And then the question is, do I want to be in the same trade as those people, you know, who sort of open up their normie mainstream newspaper because even the financial newspapers as you mentioned they've been the coverage has been insane uh, and that's yeah. been for very self-evident reasons because the market's gone crazy and outperformed everything which is sick uh, and then analysts attempt to explain it and talk about some of the causal mechanisms and so on and so forth and the etf is like number one and it's not even close so even in the finance world i feel like there's a decent degree of um, knowledge and awareness around the etf itself so if you're in the category of people who are waiting for the day of the news to buy because you kind of see it somewhere else in non-financial news or wherever else, uh, or you think that that's when it really starts, ignoring that we've been writing this for six months and, you know, uh, doubled essentially, do you want to be the same tra in the same trade as those people? The answer could be maybe, but th that's not my first <laughs> inclination. You know? Yeah, I think, I think in general, like, if the the traditional markets do well, if like everything is kind of like in that perfect zone, that can actually be a good thing, right? Like you see all of these people 
um, that that are going to see it on the news and they buy in and maybe that'll just make it keep going um, if the market conditions generally are right. Um, but that is way beyond my pay grade. I'm just a stupid crypto guy. I bought when price was low, sold it when it was a little bit higher. And I'm now just sitting here being like, I wonder how this is going to turn out. <laughs> yes. because it's, it's too it's too complicated for me. Like I generally always sell the news. Like I, I, I tend to do like, I mean, it's a meme, right? The whole buy the rumors, sell the news thing isn't it's a it's a big meme but i always play by that rule book in crypto like with any old coin with any with anything in this space i tend to just look at news event especially when price went up as sell signals and if you if you put news events that were like quite significant um on on the chart you will find one at almost every single top in bitcoin's history or like in old coin history too. Um, but you will obviously also find some that just started the rally. So I, it depends, but uh, I I just, I'm not in the camp that is like, I'm going to buy the news and because I think it's going to get more explosive. Uh, and that's just my trading style. I've seen some people buy the news and just hold and uh, do well with it. It just depends, basically. Bullish but unlocks I, and all that type yeah, of stuff. But yeah, I exactly. think that's like, as you mentioned, I think that's like misunderstanding the market effect at play. It's more of product of conditions, more so than the news inherently being viable, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that, that's a pretty tough one to get confused. But listen, you bear tard. The appropriate way is to buy the rumor and add on news. That's like, <laughs> that's the Sigma trade, you know? Uh, I mean, it is. I'm 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 impressed by people that are willing to kind of take these risks. Um, uh, for me, kind of like, I like to take the, the small steps, you know? Like you you take the, the certain or like almost certain, there's never a certain win, but the almost certain wins, like I like to take those and then just sit out when I'm when I'm uncertain. And then do it again and again and again. And some people are like, okay, I won. Let me roll this into another trade, and then let me roll this into another trade. Um, and then that basically like in a in a in a trade for like two years, just compounding, compounding, compounding upwards. I'm always impressed. Like the the, the results are always also impressive, at least for a while. Sadly, at the end of the day, it usually ends with that person being back at zero, right? Like if you compound long enough um no matter how right you are at some point you're going to be wrong and then you get fucked so you have to at, at some point kind of step off the gas but if you can do that right like you can do some impressive things right i've seen people run up run up portfolios from nothing to insane numbers just by keeping keeping the money in the game and just adding 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 but it's not my my kind of my kind of world makes sense um yeah i i, I think that's enough pontification on the philosophical side of things as far yeah. as how this i mean ask the market about the market right so <laughs> it'll, <laughs> yeah, it'll we'll tell see. us pretty soon um on the ta whatever side is there any weekly time frame stuff that you still think is relevant uh, i spoke about the weekly cluster at 41.8 to 43 mm -hmm. on monday markets as like hey we had a red week if we're going to retest that's a potential area uh, it looks yeah. like the weekly closes back above it that, that that looks all right actually i mean obviously there, there are a couple of days left in the whole weekend thing uh but you know this wasn't a week of continuation after the one uh red week that we had uh yeah. the, the only other area realistically that i'm eyeballing if we just get like an x like a, another leg on btc into the etf and realistically mate there's only like a week left right it's like 10 days a week and a half whatever that whole period yeah. and it's christmas new year's all of that yeah, well, wasn't last Christmas really bullish? I could be completely wrong. Um, oh, I actually don't know how last. I mean, you can just I can just check on the chart. Yeah, go go do some research in turn while I <laughs> while I look at the weekly chart. Um, the uh, the only other nope. Oh, it wasn't. Well, fuck you. There was one oh, Christmas that was, that was bullish. Hilariously. So. Oh wait, no, no. Last Christmas was okay. Yeah, I'm just. Yeah. On see, the... I told you. Stop looking for the outlier bearish examples, Don. <laughs> no, no. I was just I was just like it cannot be that the top is already so long ago, but um yeah last christmas was okay it was actually really good and then the one before that was quite bad um i don't think you can necessarily make the one before that was really good and there the you one go it's gonna be that... good <laughs> and the one before that was um also good and then it was really bad <laughs> it just goes back this is true quant alpha on technical roundup that's this is 
It's pure seasonality edge. Um, yeah, sorry, on the weekly chart, the only other area that I've got, if we have another leg into ETF uh, announcement in the, in the next 10 days or so, I'm just like eyeballing the lower high at 46K. And there's a sort of weekly cluster that we built around it at like 47 to 50. Um, that That's really the only other technical area where I'd be like, I mean, that's that's the kind of thing where if, if we really rally into that on the day of the ETF and like hard spike it on news, I think there might be a trade there. Because, uh, you know, I, I don't like shorting this thing in general. And thank God, you know, whatever, whatever's left of my portfolio thanks me for it. Uh, but, but that's one of those setups where if we get like a mega spike into the news itself, uh, I'd at least be open-minded to doing business at like 47.50. Uh, but I'm the, the only pushback I have on myself there is that I'm cognizant of falling into the trap where you basically start hallucinating and adding resistance levels because you have this overarching trade idea. Like, oh yeah, well, I'm going to look to de-risk. You know, people are going to de-risk into the ETF, so I should look to sell some of that and ca catch on to that flow. And then you just start adding resistance levels as the market goes higher. I think that's super dangerous. And it's like reverse bag holder activity where they'll yeah. just add levels of support that don't exist as the market's going lower. I don't want to get caught in that trap, uh, but I would be very surprised if there is no trade around the ETF announcement itself. So uh, that that's really from a swing point of view, that's that's the next one on my radar realistically. Yeah. I mean for me it's basically I don't really care about the levels at all um until the ETF is through because it's such a big event that I like I'm like yeah this could be resistance, this could be support. But at the end of the day, I need to see how the ETF plays out and then I can make judgment. Um, so I do have a few levels, but they're very far away. And the reason for that is basically just like if it gets that far before the ETF, I could like I could see myself do something. Um, so if, for example, if we for some reason, and I don't think that's going to be happening, but if we for some reason crash to 32K, um, I would be I would be there in January, like in the first week of January and I would buy this thing, right? Like at that point, I think it's a pretty straight up buy. Uh, you've retraced a large chunk of the the kind of the, the ETF movement to the upside. That seems like a decent kind of bet, even if you just sell into the bounce, right? Like, so that would be interesting. Uh, same thing with 60K. Like if we run all the way to 60K before the ETF, I think you can just short it with all your might. Um, I'm not going to, but I think at that point, like that's way overdone. And then uh, you're going to get quite good returns from that. Anything in between there, like I would not do any business um, before the ETF. And that means that 99% of the time, I'm just not going to do anything before the ETF happens. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those are the two things. Uh, the two levels that I find interesting. There's a few that you can draw and there's going to be one that kind of makes like marks out the top or marks out the bottom. But I think it's relatively meaningless just in face of this kind of big catalyst. So that's kind of that's kind of what I'm looking at. So my my levels are quite boring just based on that. It's like 30 uh, or 60. Fuck you. I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I think anything in between like, yeah, you can take trades off and whatever, but it's all going to be it's all going to be meaningless. Like if you if you draw a support like at 40K, um, and you're like, okay, that's a really good, like, or like whatever, 41, 40, 38, whatever. And you're like, oh, this is a really good support level. If the ETF comes through and gets denied, or if it gets approved, even I think uh, that's going to be run over. Or the same thing on the announcement, right? Like, let's say you short, you short 45K because you really like that level. If the ETF gets announced the same day, uh, you're going to be liquidated, right? So it just kind of, it just kind of depends, basically. And I think the only really interesting points here are the, the high time frame, very far away levels. Because at that point, it's crazy enough that um, kind of having a trade into the ETF actually makes sense to me. Uh, unless you're a long-term holder, whatever, uh, I think if at that point you bought 16K um, and you're just like, I want to write this thing till 200K, uh, I think, I mean, I don't think it's going to go back to your entry. So... Godspeed to you, soldier. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, don't diddle in the middle, right? I guess to some extent, these mid-40s types of levels are diddling in the middle. Uh, from a mm. timing point of view, uh, at least for swings, I'm unlikely to pump this until either day of or post ETF. Unless the market starts doing something crazy beforehand, um, I don't you know, for, I don't think the timing is, is quite there yet. Uh, yeah. Daily-wise, I know on 
Wednesday, you still had this sort of cluster looking thing on the daily, basically mm -hmm. the, 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 the origin of the breakdown to some extent in sort of early December, earlier this month. Um, is that still a level? Do you care about it? I mean, by definition, it's not 30 or 60. So is that just yeah. one of those TA I'm watching, observing type of things? Or is there, yeah. do you put any weight to it? No, I don't really put any weight to it. Like short term, yeah. Like that's the thing, right? The, uh, it, it seems like we're going to get the ETF uh, news in January. So we still have quite a bit to go. So you can use these low time frame kind of levels to map stuff out and be like, okay, maybe we get like a, an impulse day today. Um, maybe we get a little bit um, of action, but I, I don't really care. Like if it, if it breaks 44 K and it's been testing that level a bunch, right? Like that, like, or that cluster in general, like yeah. it tested it four, five, six times, depending on how you count it. Um, like it gets worse and worse. So I wouldn't want to necessarily like in general, like that's the thing. If I say like, Hey, I wouldn't want to be short here. Like it seems kind of insane to me to hold a short if the ETF announcement could come any day, right? Like that just seems scary as fuck because maybe there's going to be a 10% up wick. Um, we've had that before. Um, and then do you really want to stomach that risk? I mean, if you, if, if it's low leverage enough and your target is wide enough, maybe, right? But it seems a little bit not great. But also, I don't necessarily want to tell people like, hey, if, if it breaks 44K, just long it because we're so close. That, I mean, you can, and I think it's as actually like probably a better trade than the short side of things because there's a good chance that you can actually close your longs into the announcement candle that you're gonna get. Um, so it's I think it's better better kind of trade, but still not that great. Like it seems it seems just to me like it's it's a time of enjoying Christmas, enjoying New Year's with the family, and uh, holding spot bags if you have them, if you want them and uh, keeping the leverage basically at zero just to make sure that uh, you don't get fucked by Wix to the up or downside. Listen, that's the softest shit I've ever heard. You you <laughs> do enjoy your fake made up holidays. I'm going to be grinding the one minute chart on 50x leverage and that's why I'm going to make it. Okay. Well, I mean, maybe. How, how, dare, how dare you tell me to like go out and have social interactions? <laughs> where where am I and it. where are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, fine. That's fair. Um, yeah. Cool. That's, I think that's really it for BTC. I will make a larger sort of comment that in general, uh, if you're the sort of monthly, weekly, daily, super high time frame pullback, uh, swing trading system, you know, almost per the newsletter, um, there's really nothing to do at the moment. And to be, to be completely candid, there, there really hasn't been a lot to do for some time. You either have those good entries and you're waiting for the ETF to reassess them if not having sold already or you're still you're waiting for that 10 to you know 20 to 40 percent pullback the, those are the two as that's pretty much what we wrote in the newsletter as well right like you're either yeah. already positioned so you don't really give a fuck about the vol risk on the announcement itself or you're waiting for a larger high time frame flush correction thing to position uh, or I think, go on. or you're trading the 10th meme coin of the day yes yes oh my, i'm gonna enjoy that segment of the show when we talk about the <laughs> uh, more adventurous parts of the sector um but i think that's fair for btc and eth right i yeah. mean especially when the market's moving like this you almost feel robbed if you're not in a position and i can understand that on certain altcoins and uh, rotations and narratives and so on and so forth as we'll discuss but from a purely technical btc swing perspective given the proximity of the deadline Given the magnitude of the move and the absence of those high time frame pullbacks and or trading around technical levels, uh, if you have that type of system, there's just not a lot to do at the moment. And sometimes that's okay, you know. Um, it, it's there's nothing worse than having like a good system that works for you, and then because it's not printing signals when a lot of other systems are printing signals, you you just start basically hallucinating edge and doing things that you have uh, no edge in doing and no business in doing. Um, so you know, just just to get that out of the way. Yeah. Should we I move think on? It, yeah, I think in general, like if if you and this is the thing, right? Like Bitcoin and to a large extent even more actually, ETH has been quite boring. Yes. And like they've been they've been moving, but they've not been moving too much. The action has been in, in the old coins. And I think like I mean for me, for example, right? Like I don't I don't like to trade the old coins as much as I like to trade Bitcoin, but what I see a lot of people do is basically they force trades based on the altcoin movement on Bitcoin and ETH because they're like, these altcoin traders are making a bunch of money. I don't really like trading altcoins, so I'm going to like 
crank up the leverage on Bitcoin and ETH. Right. Um, it's the worst thing you can do. If anything, if you want to, like if you're absolutely itching to do something, take a, a tiny portion of your portfolio, right? And this is obviously advice that comes a little bit too late because your coins have been going quite quite crazy for quite a while. But take a little bit of that money that you are itching to trade with slap it on like either on chain or like in general just go on a shitty exchange and trade those shitty coins um <laughs> that everyone else is trading because like if you just slap on risk on bitcoin and eth um just because other people are making money on all coins uh, you're gonna lose money like that's almost guaranteed whereas in the open world uh the the musical chair game can go on for longer than you'd expect so um don't obviously don't put your entire portfolio and trade these chitter chitter coins like even a percent sometimes even a percent like if your edge is really try trading bitcoin and eve even if you just take one percent out of that portfolio and trade the the shitty coins with at least it keeps you from doing something dumb on bitcoin and eve um and i think that's very important like if you cannot stop yourself from over trading um trade with a small portion of your portfolio somewhere else yeah it's a nice fomo itch uh, scratch well scratching the itch uh, it's also a nice distraction in general and even if your small portfolio allocation towards the shitters ends up going to zero that's still losing less money than you would have if you just tried to force edge on the majors so yep. i think that's that's a really good way of looking at it i think in general we've covered a reasonable number of ways to sort of say stay sane from a portfolio management point of view you'll recall we also discussed the idea of having like a suicide stack um, when it comes to the spot stuff, I'm also having an anti FOMO stack where, you know, even if you don't have, don't have a high time frame trend type of setup, but you're feeling insane FOMO, you just buy some spot and put it away. So if the market goes nuclear, you don't feel completely sick to your stomach that you have zero exposure. And th there is a sort of non-linear impact on mental health between zero and even like 1%. Yeah. I, I don't and know if you're making money. That. Yeah, 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 yeah I mean, exactly. It's like, you're like, oh, well, and it's easy to, like, if you then see something that is interesting, like you have a tiny portion in something already, it's easier to hop into something if you then see something that's good, right? Like, let's say you you see Solana is trading at 30 and it's breaking out. Um, if you had none of it and you're like, oh, but it already went up like 4x, um, you you might just sit out the, the 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 barrier of entry just seems a little bit wider. But let's say you had a tiny stack of Solana already, and you see it break out, and you're like involved, and you're like, "Fuck yeah, I'm making money on this." And then you're like, "But actually, the setup is quite good. Maybe I can just buy a little bit more." Yes, expanding so can, a position is always easier than yeah creating a fresh one, right? I mean, I've oh, got yeah. some Solana shitter NFTs done from like fucking 2021, so <laughs> that, that, that's been interesting to observe. Yeah, I've I've been cheering you on. It's actually quite <laughs> nice. Like this is quite cool. Um, the a lot of the kind of like stuff from the bear market got quite rescued, if you will. Yeah. Like even the even the the FTX claims got rescued by the Solana move, basically. Absolutely. Right? Like a bunch of people are gonna get a lot more money out of this, um, because Solana went up a lot, um, which is quite nice. Anthropic as well, uh, which I think Sam invested in. Right, they've got yeah. some. They've got an equity stake there. They're they're raising a pretty high valuation. So yeah, we, we sort of covered the recovery narrative before, but I think it's a net positive. Obviously, there are some weird. Uh, you, you know, the estate is still like insanely bloated in terms of lawyer fees. Like they, they oh, actually yeah. make so your eyes sad. water. Uh, yeah. And then the whole idea that they're getting their USD balance. Like I get it from a legal procedural accounting point of view, but man, it hurts. You know. Yeah, when... it's fucked up. It's not like the the whole um, Mount Gox thing where. Yes, you get like you get less Bitcoin back, but at least you get Bitcoin back, and Bitcoin went up a shitload. Yes, um, yeah, it's a little bit of like that's that's just very very fucked. I I talked with my brother about it because he had a bunch of money on 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 Blockfolio, which got like went under with FTX basically, um, and he was like, oh, it's it's quite cool that that crypto is up so lot, wow. like so much, and I was like, ah, sorry to tell you, but. Um, you're going to be paid out in USD, not in <laughs> your crypto. And it's going to be basically bottom selling prices, which is terrible, right? Like it's like 16 to 20K Bitcoin oh, or something, yeah. um, which is not great. But Yeah, well, I think any recovery is better. But, you know, I've sort of been following 
how claims have been trading. That's good. But the whole, you know, USD denominated plus lawyer fees just leave a bit of a sour taste in all, in all of the proceedings. But yeah. nonetheless, nonetheless, Don, it's time to talk about your favorite trade, which is ETH BTC, ETH oh, yeah. and Ethereum beta. Because um, at the moment, ARB is up 13%. OP oh, shit, is go. up fifteen percent, and even Lido is up six percent. And I'm <laughs> sure there are some others that I haven't updated my watch list to reflect. Um, now, is this an ETH rotation, or is it just Hasaka tweeting and <laughs> having massive copy trading market impact? God bless him. Um, I mean, he does actually have massive. Dude, he has trading. enormous market impact. Like, I mean, it's it's not a joke when when you say like it, the market goes up 10 percent if hasaka tweets about something yeah it's like, not it's a joke actually, at all like that's actually how it is like, and it's, it's not like a diss or a moral indictment either. no no it's, it's just, just the reality of the market yeah know? yeah i mean he's just been so spot on on the yeah exactly points, um that people are just like fuck it i'll buy this thing even when it is 10 percent up over the last five minutes because he tweeted about it which is fucking wild to me i mean I, there's there's a reason why i stay away from from like tweeting about all coins and doing all that kind of things like the main reason is because i'm not currently trading them but the secondary reason is because like i would like to avoid this kind of stuff but i mean if that's all you do and you just like to like why not right like i'm not judging anyone for having a market impact because they're trading well like that's just seems a little bit dumb too like i've seen a bunch of people um back in the day that would tweet shitty old coins right and all obviously depends like if you're trading like if you're tweeting about a 200 like the like a, a 2 million market cap old coin and then you're moving it uh, i think that's a pretty shitty thing to do but if you're tweeting about solana avax whatever and it goes up like 10 percent uh, it's just how it is yes yes and also tweeting for exit liquidity versus just oh yeah because you're in a trade i think yeah. there's some differentiation there as well uh but on the ETH front so if we look at ETH BTC first um yep it's up on the day it's up on the day and you know that that's some form of failed breakdown right there was a triple bottom set with those wicks between the 22nd of October 9th of November 7th of December uh we had the breakdown in the last couple of days that looked like the range was cooked and now we're we're back above it I would note that sentiment I don't know. I go back and forth on the sentiment point. I, w I watched your stream where, you know, w one of the people in the comments said that you're wrong about ETH sentiment and it's it, it, it's sort of as bad as it gets and it's not that optimistic and rose tinted. Uh, I understand your counter argument, but perhaps if there's any time to make a negative ETH sentiment point, it's in the last week where yes. a lot of the ETH maxis have straight up been apologizing for dissing Solana. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that, that's pretty extreme uh, because that that used to be their punching bag uh, all through the bear market. I mean, you the cannot FTX stuff the, the market. Like, you know, go on. The Soul Eve. Look at Soul Eve. You literally cannot. <laughs> they cannot shit talk it anymore. Like yeah. it's like this is wild. Like it's so fucking wild. Mate, Soul is Eve a is basically chart, isn't it? at all time highs. If I if I remember very correctly. close. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah, and I mean, you just cannot like <laughs> that is mental. That is absolutely mental. So it's hard to to kind of do it. But I do agree with you that um, so I, my my sentiment thing just kind of goes back and forth. So whenever whenever Eve goes up or like Eve BTC goes up one percent, <laughs> sentiment goes euphoric as fuck. And whenever Eve BTC goes down five percent, sentiment goes really really bearish. So it's basically been this back and forth where. You go down 5%, and everyone is fucking bearish, and then it has a day or two where it goes up 2 or 3%, and sentiment goes completely euphoric, and everyone is on the ETH train. And then it happens over and over and over again. You can actually look at ETH BTC on the four hour chart, and you can literally see this happen every other day. Like, it's actually just crazy to me. Like, you see straight up, like, ETH BTC ripping up, and I mean, ripping up is in quote unquote, because it's barely moving, right? But given it's not been moving much in general, uh, it just looks like it's going up a lot. But it basically it goes up like 15%. It went up on the on the ETF announcement, right? Um, and then it retraces that and it goes up again. And it's always these like it's an impulse and then people get really, really euphoric. I mean, even just now like the last eight hours if you just go on twitter people are tweeting about eve and it's finally time and like a bunch of people are like super 
and super, super excited about it. Um, so at that point, you'd be like, hey, sentiment is way too good for the price action, right? Because if you even go just to the weekly time frame, that's not the greatest looking chart. Um, but then when it goes down, it kind of flips the opposite way. So I, I don't know. Like, I'm a little bit on the... <laughs> like, I would say sentiment is too good just because people should be ignoring this if it goes up to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5% and be be just kind of like, oh, yeah, it's going to end the same way. But for some reason, every time it pumps, it's like this time is different um, kind of sentiment. But I think in general, the closer we get to the ETF, the the better it is for ETH BTC. And in general, if you go on the weekly time frame on, I think it's log chart, but let me check. Yeah, on log chart, if you draw a line from the 19th of December in 2016, um, to the 30th December in 2019. Oh, yeah, the Don trend line, the one from Wednesday yeah, stream, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, we touched it, basically. Yeah. Like, that was the low. Um, it was very close, but depending on how you draw it, um, it touched it. I mean, and... I, drew trend line, I drew the trend line in the only way you can, as in to make it fit. <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> it touched it. It's fine. It's perfect, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, like... That was close enough, right? So in my opinion, and this is something that I said on the last stream as well, this is actually, while we were trading down there, I was like, this is actually the first time where I can steel man the EVE argument, right? Because before it just seemed retarded to me. Like I saw so many people making the EVE argument while the EVE PTC chart just completely looked trash and while we had a very clear Bitcoin narrative. Now the Bitcoin narrative is going to run out um, pretty soon. And we have some sort of technical level. So I think like, like if you really need to buy or needed to buy ETH, that was like a good spot. Um, the next better spot, and I think this is actually a better entry, is just going to be above 0 0.057 um, as kind of like a range reclaim kind of thing. That's the more like less, less risky kind of way to get into this thing. Um, just based on how sentiment is and how everyone is just kind of too euphoric about it every time it moves a percent. Um, but yeah, I mean, this was the first time where I was like, I can make the, the EVE argument properly. Um, you have a little bit of a TA thing and you have the narrative to boost, which is basically like, okay, the Bitcoin ETF is, is so close. So might as well start rotating to ETH. One thing that I that I mentioned back in on Wednesday too is just based like it's just if the Bitcoin ETF doesn't go well, as in if we get the pullback that I'm expecting it to, um, you're kind of shit out of luck on ETH because that's the only narrative that ETH has right now. Um, basically the rotation after the ETF. And if that doesn't go on the Bitcoin front, I don't think it will go on the ETH front either. Yeah, I was going to ask essentially what what's the counter argument or at least the implications for the market if we get ETH outperformance into the Bitcoin ETF. Um, I, I think uh, either way, the, the sort of implications have to be extreme, right? The extreme yeah. bullish implication is that this is a proper full-fledged rotational bull market, right? And mm -hmm. the spot, the Bitcoin spot ETF, yeah, that has some news, but it's not a sell the news thing because those flows aren't going to sell or do whatever else, but they're going to stay in the ecosystem and instead rotate to ETH. And so, you know, Bitcoin can go down a little, whatever, it doesn't matter. It'll more or less stay afloat uh, because that risk is just moving from A to B as opposed to from A out of the ecosystem, which is the extremely bullish case, right? That's like almost hot ball of money 2021 levels where no nothing really sells off, you just pump something else. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And, and of course, there's the other extreme implication that this is a very frothy signal uh, and the market is sort of front running a bullish rotation that's not going to come to pass. So instead, you have ETF resulting in some sort of sell the news event uh, and the market, instead of selling the news or risking off, just rotates into something that's been weaker and arguably riskier and underperforming and then just get turbo shit on uh, double the dose, right? And by double the dose, I mean underperform BTC during the entire ETF period and then rotate and then get shit on on the BTC and USD front because the market sells off. I think with how the market is shaping up right now, uh, it's more likely than not to be one of those extreme scenarios. I don't really think that if ETH continues to get bid and we see like ETH ecosystem layer two bid, etc. I don't really see how that has like a middle ground 
uh, consequence or implication. It's, it's either, oh my fucking God, send full 2021 program, or it's like the most frothiest, toppiest <laughs> uh, mm. signal available. I, I don't really see how this comes out to something um you know, reasonable. Is, is that an insane extremist view? No, I mean, I've been saying like, you're kind of safe in Bitcoin and ETH, uh, Bitcoin and all coins as long as ETH doesn't do well. So if ETH starts kind of like catching a bit, I think um, it's time to rotate out uh, of everything else. And then you can play the ETH trade maybe um, if you absolutely need to, but uh, the USD, like rotating into USD seems seems better to me at that point. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I I mean, in general, like I said, like the closer we get to the ETF, I think the the more likely it is that ETH is gonna kind of catch a bit. And then, um, yeah, I, it's a little bit worrisome because that kind of implies that the whole. And the only reason why I say that is basically because it implies that the whole ETF thing is already priced in, and that you're gonna see outflows. Because if it wasn't, and the Bitcoin ETF is is approved, and you have a bunch of people that are willing to kind of pile into Bitcoin, then you would expect Bitcoin to outperform, generally speaking. Because the, the only the only spot, like the only coin that has an ETF, would be Bitcoin at that point, right? So you'd argue like, hey, if the ETF is as bullish as people say, you wouldn't even see the rotation because Bitcoin would just get new flows, and that would be outdoing the rotational flows but i doubt that is going to happen so yeah it's it's good for the eve tarts it's just i <laughs> i hope it's um it's not gonna be one where yeah if btc goes up but if usd goes down um which would be the ultimate insult because it's the worst market conditions to trade when your coin underperforms when bitcoin goes goes uh, goes up and then outperforms when bitcoin goes down because at the end of the day you're not making usd gains right like there's nothing to trade basically um something that we've been seeing for example from eve is that it's been underperforming and then it barely goes up when bitcoin goes up and you're like well fuck this <laughs> This is kind of stupid, you know, but it also doesn't. And then Bitcoin went down and EFPTC went up a little bit. And then you can also not even buy the dip, right? Because there's no dip to be had. It's just like it just floats around being a piece of shit and you don't get any trade. And uh, that seems to me like how ETH is trading right now. And that's the worst way to trade. It's OK for holders because you get less volatility. You can look at your portfolio and you have a little bit of a stable coin on there. Which is is better than than which is having... why you're in crypto, right? <laughs> Preserve <laughs> yeah. wealth. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like as an investor, maybe it's it's better to see that than like ten percent up and down days. But um, as a trader, that's the worst way to spend your time, right? You want to have the one that out like that basically outdoes out do, does Bitcoin both ways, um, to the down and to the upside, yeah. because then you can buy the dip and then make a bunch of money when Bitcoin goes up. And it's just better than the the opposite. Yeah, apathy is a real killer when it comes to yeah. altcoins because volatility usually goes out the window with it. Uh, but I think you also just made a very good argument in terms of if you th if it is your view that the Bitcoin spot ETF is either not priced in or is insufficiently priced in, then you should, in theory, have no argument for rotating into ETH. Yeah, but I, I think there are, there's a large group of people with those overlapping beliefs. Like, oh, look, look, the spot ETF is like the most bullish thing ever and it's not priced in. And I'm also buying the thing without the spot ETF that's been underperforming. It's like that yeah. that's pretty difficult to reconcile outside of, you know, short term trades and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's just basically people, people love to be bullish if I think. Um, Bless them. Yeah, and it's OK. <laughs> no shame in that. I mean, high right? time frame I mean, ETH BTC, like really high time frame ETH BTC. Still a yeah. decent looking chart. I know? mean, it's the best. And to be like after all of this shit talking, right? it's still the best old coin um, in in the history of crypto, in my yes. opinion. Um, as in like you look at the, the ETH BTC chart um, on a monthly or even yearly basis, um, like that has had cycles that made higher lows. Um, show me another one that has had cycles this long um, that have made higher lows. It's going to be tough. Like, that's just going to be really, really tough. Um, cycle after cycle kind of 
maintaining the gains basically because if you look at litecoin litecoin's had like been around a long time and you can see the cycles on that chart as well it's just been very much lower highs and lower lower lows and um, there's a lot of other coins that are in the same boat um, that have been around for quite a while and they keep making new lows eth on the other hand so far at least has maintained an uptrend and that's quite impressive considering that bitcoin's been up only like up only for years and years and years and i mean eve has basically been up only against bitcoin over over the years so not i don't want to talk it too much just <laughs> yeah. in general like the short term and funnily enough the short term in this kind of lens is like the last couple of months um just didn't make much sense to me it's making more sense now like i'm i don't i i'm not gonna talk, call anyone dumb for kind of rotating into eve now um i don't necessarily think it's the best trade still but it's at least not dumb anymore in my opinion so yeah, I think that's that's, that's quite a bit of a difference between what i what my opinion was in the last couple of months and i think i made that quite clear like how dumb i thought the eve trade was gonna be and i mean at the end of the day it was um i underestimated the other coins though like it's not like i was completely correct on everything because i didn't expect solana for example to go to go 10x um from the lows i expected it to, to outperform bucks, dude isn't that crazy yeah yeah it's completely nuts i mean i we we talked about solana and we were like this is the coin to bet on um i didn't bet on it <laughs> but i was like Bro, i wish if i fucking you... held it like God, you know, this is always the thing, right? You have like a good yeah. high time frame trade idea, uh, but then your targets are like an order of magnitude wrong. You're like, well, that was fun. <laughs> like, Yep. And then you cope hard. Then you cope because hard. Because you're like, fuck this. I was already in it. I just, I didn't even need to do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I have that all the time, but it's what it is. Let's um, talk about Solana, actually. Because, I mean, yeah. most of our attention went, went around the $30-ish breakout. They're like, hey, this is strong it's probably going to keep being strong and rotating is a bad idea in general yep i was probably most strong when i thought it would at least slow down or pull back at around 47 ish that mm -hmm. old range high um but even if you take like the candle close or even the high of the weekly that invalidated that idea it's up like 50 percent <laughs> uh, 50 <laughs> yep. to 60 percent from that point um which is impressive to, to say the least. And now it's like even, you know, adding TA levels to this thing seems seems a bit weird. Probably the most I'd be comfortable with is uh, the monthly I mean, time frame. Yeah, well, I was about to say, look at the monthly time frame. Yeah, that's, that, that's you know, if there's any, if there's ever a t tricky area for this thing, if there's going to be one, and maybe my judgment is not great for it, given I thought that 50% lower was a tricky area in theory, um, 100 to like 120-ish yeah. uh, is pretty much the last slash only level of resistance i think uh if you yeah. if you believe in such a thing <laughs> uh dude it's almost like yesterday we were writing the newsletter um talking about the bearish retest on solana at 135 do you remember that shit like, oh yeah yeah so and like it's <laughs> we're not that far away which yeah. is crazy because you know we had an entire industry meltdown since that point no big deal um, yeah, and 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 the main the main face of Solana yeah, is, exactly. is in jail. It's like uh, I mean, obviously, I'm not saying like I mean Solana was kind of like the Sam coin. I'm not saying the people behind Solana in any way, shape, or form affiliated. Too no, much. sure, sure, sure. Um, but yeah, it's wild. It's wild. Um, I, I and this is something. And um, when like a lot of people will be confused about this, and they're like, "Why the fuck is Solana running so much?" And um, in my opinion, and this is uh, like an ADIQ opinion, basically, you have a coin that people know and that is working decently well, right? And you have an a, an event where people that even like even the people that love the coin basically get washed out, and that was the FTX collapse, right? Um, I mean, people were like, okay, this is going to zero, basically. If a coin goes low enough, and this happens from time to time in crypto, um, the bounce can be, like, completely crazy. Now, it can just stay, like, it can just stay and go to irrelevancy afterwards. But if it starts bouncing, and that's what Solana did, right? And this is why we kept talking about that if you have to bet on an altcoin, Solana is the interesting bet. If it bounces, you basically have a bunch of people that sold their positions much lower. Um, 
they want to get back in, right? They they had good reasons to be in this coin. It's a decent coin. It's not like Solana is like is like ADA or whatever. Um, but they sold because of other reasons. They sold because of FTX blowing up. And then you have a lot of sidelines, sideline capital, a lot of people that don't hold it anymore. And then the bounces can be astronomical. And I think that's basically what Solana is going through. Um, that on top of the whole people are just remembering the last cycle where Solana went completely crazy. Uh, the whole Soul Luna AVAX trade. Um, so yeah, I think basically people got washed out and got squeezed the fuck. Um, a lot of people were bearish too, which helps. Um, I saw a lot of people be like, hey, um, all the way up basically, I'm going to try shorting this thing, which yeah. is quite stupid. Like the FTX estate and all this stuff have yeah, so much yeah. supply, etc. Yeah, you have a lot of reasons to sell. And when you have a lot of reasons to sell, people have a lot of reasons to short. And then um, you have a lot of reasons to go up if a lot of people short. It's just the simplest way. Yeah. Um, and uh yeah i that's that's why this was so interesting now i didn't catch any of it actually um i think oh don you pleb you don't have any solana nfts from 2021 that you're using <laughs> to cope with what is this fucking amateur hour come on man yeah i mean i was i was on the the whole the whole like bitcoin trade um yeah. try to try to take that make it as as well as possible in hindsight obviously could have heeded my own advice and just had like a little bit of a shitter portfolio that would have been fun um bro we suck at we suck dick at altcoins that's no secret uh, but like I mean, the, the, the ones we point out in like technical roundup like if, if they manage to make make it through our barrier of complacency and laziness they always fucking cook oh least, yeah, like, yeah the strike I mean, rate is pretty decent it's like I mean, rndr inge solana link you know like all, all this shit from earlier yeah. technical roundup before alts completely melted up um so, you know, I mean, that, I would, that's cope as well, by the way, just trying to make myself feel better. No, no, I would, I would say we're very good or coin analyzers. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, not necessarily the best traders. Um, for me, it's a lot of laziness. Um, I'll be quite frank. Like I, I, I look at Solana, I'm like, it's at 90 and I'm like, oh, cool. I mean, I'm happy for the FTX estate. I'm happy that a um, bunch of people are making money. I'm happy for your NFTs. And I'm yeah. like, whatever. I'm not fucking you know? selling. <laughs> like, if this goes to 200, maybe I'll start coping. And I'm going to be like, ah, maybe I should have bought like... 31. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just I'm just very lazy on that front. But at least the, the, we didn't mislead anyone that was listening to the show because we were like, Solana is the coin to watch. Um, Solana and Link, I think we said, which turned out to be quite quite the nice trades. Now, I think it's at monthly resistance and I think you're kind of like, as a sideline side analyzer, <laughs> uh, I think... Uh, you're reaching at this point like i think this is this is where this is where um, you take tell people to take profits even even though you don't have any fucking profits yourself like exactly <laughs> the crypto twitter special it's like this, tighten up your stops what fucking stops they have any positions you can't <laughs> tell me what to do <laughs> yeah but i think at this point like it's it's reaching a little bit um now it could go higher um or it can always go higher but i think even if you expect it to go higher you'd expect it to kind of like struggle a while in between 90 and 120 so i'm not saying sell everything at 90 i i could see this go higher i'm just saying in general this is the area like because people have been asking me on every single stream to talk about solana and i've been like hey there's low time frame wise there's no reason to do anything if you're in this it could even go to like 100 whatever now it's at 100 basically now it's where i said it could even go to and i think at this point, you actually have to watch this position a little bit more actively. Um, but I could still see it go higher. I mean, this is a strong coin. There's basically not been any consolidation from the bottom. So, Bro, like, none. I, I, yeah, none. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to bear tart it. Um, for me, if I actually want to get into all coins and get out of my laziness, basically, um, the fact of the matter is that I wouldn't be buying it anywhere above. Uh, forty dollars, and God. that is basically monthly support. Now, if that never hits, I couldn't care less. Like that's the difference between a lot of the people listening and me, is because I I just don't care. Uh, like if I get a good setup, I get a good setup and I can trade it. If not, then not. But um, it hit monthly resistance. I I'd, I'd be willing. Um, and I've been I've been asking the people on the live stream on Wednesday. 
um, to tell me um, to get off my lazy ass if if Solana reaches like thirty to forty dollars again, because I think at that point be it'd be an interesting trade again. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I look at this thing. Like it's at high time from resistance. I'm a high high time frame kind of guy. Uh, I would expect it to go to high time frame support. But if it doesn't, and all coins oftentimes don't, then so be it. Could we bait you in with some intermediate levels somewhere no. in between, like no. a compromised on maybe no. a good old fifty something? Nope. <laughs> that has nothing. I I just I I don't see the point. Okay. Like so, the range, if you will, your favorite uh, approach is one hundred to one twenty resistance ish, forty thirty to which 40 is hilarious to say. Like that's quite stupid i mean look at the 12 month chart like you could look at the yearly chart on fucking solana that's fucking hilarious like what the fuck is this chart maybe it goes to a thousand dude a, th fuck no. a thousand <laughs> but uh what yeah. are my nfts at that point it's the only question i have mate like <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're gonna you're gonna like you run it up like it's gonna just become an art collector at that point right soul nft yeah <laughs> like they're gonna write articles Cret sold one of his soul nfts is he gonna sell his soul to <laughs> <laughs> be prepared for for shock disgusting if that if, if i ever become that I feel, I feel like i need to quit you know yeah but hey yeah. I'd, I'd quit on a high so that that, that yeah, i can't complain too much um that's solana though we, we will see um it's i agree monthly resistance it's getting there uh also this doesn't really capture a lot of the upside that's been in solana in general because yeah. nfts have been getting repriced higher which is like a bit odd so sometimes when you see the spot pair moon, we've saw this during NFT season, uh, after a certain point, because holders are basically stuck in like a locked price that they paid essentially for the NFT, uh, the price, as the token price goes up to keep the same USD price for the NFT, the price of the NFT will go down sometimes, right? Or at least not even keep up with the gains in the USD pair. It's not always just like a linear momentum across the board. Whereas in this case, pretty much everything's been getting repriced higher. And then the obvious one is the meme coins, on Solana and the DEX volumes and all that type of stuff uh, is obviously to some extent captured in the Sol chart, but not fully. There's just a lot of mega green candles and sort of wealth creation, if you will, um, in Sol that's not purely visible in the Sol USD chart. There's a lot of other tickers and on-chain stuff and NFTs and the ecosystem as a whole has just been straight up cooking. Yeah, I mean, wow. I, I'm just looking at your NFTs and like you, you what you're telling us is that you're getting rich here. <laughs> well, <I'm, laughs> dude, I round tripped them to like basically zero and didn't do shit. And now they're like a lot, but I'm also not going to do shit. If Solana sets like a new all time high and we get like a fucking NFT season, maybe I'll just dump some and I don't know, do something about it. But like, I'm not even going to fucking talk about what dog shit I, I was buying. You know, I just like, cannot believe that I, I actually sent you a DM. Like, I think like a year or so ago, or maybe two, uh, where I was like, hey, uh, I, I'm actually I'm actually going to buy a bunch of, of your NFTs because <laughs> whatever. And you said, no, no, don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, dude, it was the peak of autumn. It was the peak you of autumn. You should know year. better than to fucking listen to me about trading stuff, Don. Like, what the dude. fuck are you actually <laughs> doing? You idiot. <laughs> you, were like, you were like, no, 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 don't bother. It went to zero like this. And I was like, okay, whatever. I'll just leave it. And now I look at it and it's up like 10x from where I wanted to buy in Solana, in Solana is up a shitload. Don, probably, there's no one better there. qualified to know to ignore me when it comes to trading than you. <laughs> but you <laughs> still, you still fucking listen to me. No, no, you, you, you just didn't want me to be successful. Oh, I, yeah, that's the problem for sure. You're like, this is the peak or bottom, <laughs> but I will not have him buy it. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding, obviously. I just needed but, you. I should have used you for exit liquidity. That's what uh, I mean. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm terrible exit liquidity because I just don't buy. Like I, I think I'm the worst exit liquidity because I, I just never buy the highs. I just buy when it. If anything, I'm exit liquidity on the way to zero. I think. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I, I'd be the guy that buys like Bitcoin at like whatever 10k and then it goes to zero. I, that'd be me. <laughs> and I you don't sell either. Guy. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah. I guess I've got some collectibles now. <laughs> <To sell laughs> yeah, on that, eBay or something. At that point, I'd just be like, oh, what, whatever. I'm not gonna be the guy that buys 60k and it's like, fuck. Um, I bought the highs. Uh, just cannot be me, but um, sometimes it's good to buy the highs. I'm just saying. Uh, okay, just... Suzu, like <laughs> that's his trading advice thing, isn't it? Yeah, it is actually. Dude, and, I still um... remember when we bought like at the same time, pretty much with a lot 
uh, at the time portfolio wise like the 4k mm -hmm. monthly support on btc oh yeah oh yeah that was great and then i think you i got i, I started buying like 4.8 4.6 yeah and it started moving lower and i was like i feel sick and then you were like oh no i, I just bought like the wick at like 4.3 4.2 yep. <laughs> or whatever and i was like oh it's fine dom's in this trade what could possibly go wrong and then <laughs> it goes to 3k I, I mean, like, it bounced before. It yes, bounced yes, to it your did. entry before. <laughs> yeah, my, my entry was fucking Pico resistance. And I was like, oh, yeah. well, this is strange. But, you know, it's fine. It's probably going to slow down. It is monthly support. This could take months. And then two days later, it's like <laughs> down 20, 30% or something. And yep. yeah, that was that was absolutely sickening. Oh, I was feeling sick, yeah. I was, and I bought with, I bought with basically too much. I still remember I bought too much. And then at 3K, I was like, I'm feeling sick, not necessarily <laughs> because, because like price is down so much, but because other idiots are going to get to buy cheaper. So I loaded up a leverage account and actually bought the, the lows with leverage because it's like, this cannot be like other, other people cannot make more money on this. <laughs> oh no, just God because forbid. I, because I bought the monthly support and got scammed on it. Um. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't as, uh, to nobody's surprise, I, I wasn't as sort of in, insightful or well prepared. I just shoved in basically all spot and then yeah. just had to wait and stare at it. Because um, I knew if I started trading leverage, I'd probably FUD myself out of it or sigh up. So I just like bought a shit ton and then was panicking for months, essentially. Yeah, but I think that's part I mean, of the reason I sold that pretty early as well. Yeah. Uh, because I mean, same for me. I think I sold it early too. Dude, the I mental didn't... anguish associated with being in that trade for what felt like an eternity, even though it was yeah. a blip. Uh, God, fuck that. But I think that also speaks to the point as to, um, well, first of all, I think I, I want to bring that cred back from time to time. I feel like he's been in hibernation since fucking ever. Like the nauseatingly large position size, at least as a percentage of portfolio. Like yeah. that's a vibe, you know? And like you've got valid excuses where you've got family and kids and adulthood social life age all that shit i haven't got shit dude i'm just sat in my sat in my office and then you know in, in my mom's basement obviously that, that's where my office is uh j just fucking staring at this shit trying to trade it doing other things so I, I don't know i feel like he has to make a comeback but the second he does it's going to be the generational market top so maybe i should let you know if uh if, if i'm loading up on this type of shit but the main point is that when you've seen enough stuff and certainly in a specific instrument, like we've seen and traded 3K BTC and seen and traded like 65K BTC, uh, like our, our approach and sort of what it takes to create FOMO is going to be completely different. And like oh, even yeah. just reads on sentiment is going to be completely different. And the impact of a specific price next to the ticker are going to be far less sensitive to that. Because whatever torturous mental calculations you know someone newer in the audience might do to themselves like oh my god if i bought like 20k and i you know looking at the price now i would have made this much and whatever sort of mental gymnastics uh that you do to punish your past self we've probably done that times 10 million you know oh yeah it'd probably be completely nauseating if we sit down and did like a proper version of that like look at all the you know btc eth sol positions we ever held and what would happen if we just did nothing to them or if we held certain leverage trades they just literally make you sick uh, yeah. and I think once you get enough of that, it sort of just becomes noise. And that's a pretty good place to be in, I think. I mean, just go on the Doge USD weekly chart. And no, can... no, no. You can't do this to yourself, man. <laughs> is, no, no, no. Come on. Because I, I bought the peak or bottom on that 0.0025-ish. And I sold like a 2x on that trade and i bought like i bought the pico bottom and i wanted to buy much more but but which doge are you using which exchange um on binance doge usd doge usd yeah wait you can take whatever oh was it actually lower even oh yeah it was lower wait which cycle because i i know it in btc pairs but i it's hard to say in on on uh, the usd pair was it yeah, no, no, it was that. Yeah, so I bought, I bought that zero point zero zero two whatever in um in twenty twenty, yeah. I think, and um, I sold it for two x. Um, and the reason why I sold it basically was because I was mad at myself because I basically posted my entry on Twitter. I was like, I'm gonna buy here, and I started buying, and then a bunch of people kept front running me, and I got like super upset. Um, and I bought it on the Doge BTC side of things, you know, like. Right. Um, so I was like, I, I, you're fighting, like, basically I was trying to get filled like at, in the low sats and people would just keep on kind of like putting buy orders in front of me. And, uh, so I was like, I have too little. And I had like, I don't know, like I, I got like 
uh, something in between like 30k and 100k filled basically i sold it for like in usd and i sold it for 2x <laughs> and um now do the calculations um <laughs> from that point yeah, on jesus um i don't know how much in usd i actually got like i bought but it was more than like it was more than 10,000 quite a bit and um it ran up 200 whatever it ran up like a shitload 6300 percent in btc terms yes uh quite a bit more in in usd terms nice. so yeah um i've done i've done all of those calculations i mean i didn't really but you um, know like <laughs> you, you know yeah like basically if i got everything filled and if i i mean even if i sold halfway or like a quarter way through that rally um I would have bought all the castles in Germany. <laughs> um, but that's just how it goes, you know, like the longer you are in this market, and this is something that people, I'm sure, like when they look at Bonk, for example, this cycle, or like other meme coins um, that they can appreciate because a lot of people go through the same thing. Like the longer you stay around, the more of these kind of calculations you can make. And um, yeah, it's just it doesn't really do anything good for you. Like at any point in time, the market is going to do something and stupid shit is going to go up a lot and stuff that you owned goes up a lot and stuff that you wanted to buy goes up a lot and you just didn't buy it. And it's just how it is. And you have to kind of live with that. If that kind of makes you do dumb shit, uh, you're in the wrong business because there's always going to be like, even if you look at the traditional markets, if you look at Tesla, for example, everyone knew Tesla was around. Tesla was a thing. And then it went to infinity, basically. And uh, there's... Bro, Meta. How about oh, that yeah, one? Meta, yeah. I'm mean, Meta I actually even talked about... I can't about, believe like, you fucking fumbled that trade. That, that's oh, yeah. actually unbelievable. <laughs> you were like we logging were in, on, but were too lazy. <laughs> we were on Casual Friday. Yeah. And it was nuking below 100. And I actually was like, I'm just going to buy this thing because, I mean, this is ridiculous. And um, I couldn't make it work for some reason. I don't remember why. Um, and I was trying live on the show and I couldn't <laughs> make it work. And I was like, whatever, I'll look into it after the show. <laughs> and I just didn't. And it's up like, and this, I bet a lot of people have DM'd me actually and been like, hey, dude, this was like the 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 entry of a lifetime um oh, should i man. hold and this was on the way up like people were dming me on the way up being like hey dude uh i bought this it's great uh should i sell and i was like if you like it just keep it because i don't think that entry you're gonna get again yeah um, bro i'd so, just be blocking so those people if i fucking fumbled that and motherfuckers are dming <laughs> me being like hey i did this and i'm super rich what do i do i'm like go fuck yourself that's what oh, I dude <laughs> the, the the worst was with the doge trade because i oh, that no. was very very public with the doge trade um and i was preparing for it for an entire cycle if you remember yeah of course like i was like you have to buy dogecoin at 15 15 sats um or like 15 16 sats um because it's just the easiest trade in the world and then basically i was getting front ran so the people that were dming me about the amazing gains and thanking me were actually the people that fucked me over um because i was basically top of the order book trying to get filled and people would cut, just keep on going above me and every time my bid was starting to get filled someone would cut me so <laughs> so the people that were dming me were just kind of like um, well, they straight up took your money yeah they straight up took my money why would um, you use limit orders don imagine letting another man fill you oh dude back then i was i was still young and into foolish. that shit <laughs> yeah 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 you i had my phase you know <laughs> we all go through it it's just a phase bro yeah it's just a phase yeah um, but the thing is i think the mechanism like j just to sort of almost round off this point Mm -hmm. You might think that, oh my god, well, you, you, first of all, fuck you guys, you're shit traders, you're buying BTC at 4k, why aren't you on the Forbes list or some shit, you know, retard, Don, you should have held, you're bad at trading, fuck you, I'm not gonna listen to you, stop fumbling Solana cred, you know, you were tweeting about it at like $10, and I, th I think there was a episode of, fuck, what was it, Weekly, Weekly Open, Open, where yeah. I was like, $8, there's a support here, it's like some random candle, you know, all this shit, whatever, and you might think, well, isn't that demotivating to some extent, that you see these m mega opportunities, and you, you, you make a fraction of what you could have made. But I think that's just a matter of perspective. I think the opposite is true, if anything. Once you go through enough of those trades, the only reasonable takeaway there is that there are just so many fucking opportunities. 
and they yes. keep coming up and they look somewhat similar slash alike and the market is always going to be there tomorrow. So if you want to be like a doomer pessimist about it, you can just be like, oh my God, I've had so many opportunities and I've fucked them all up or didn't make the most of it. Uh, I'm terrible at this. What's the point? But I think the more reasonable, the more grounded, the more optimistic and probably the more accurate takeaway is that the market just doesn't run out of this shit, especially when it comes to crypto. But we've brought up like Tesla, Meta, S&P monthly support for fuck's sake, right? Yep. Like this shit is absolutely everywhere. So if you care enough and you're active enough and invested enough in the process, uh, you know, th there's always going to be something. And that should yeah. be a calming factor and something that makes you, you know, forward looking rather than uh, kicking yourself. Yeah, it's basically just you need to kind of learn how to do this properly learn to kind of control your emotions, have your portfolio grow in some form or another, like not do dumb shit. Because at the end of the day, like with the world, how it is right now, right now, I'm going to like go a little bit outside of like just crypto because the world is moving quite fast nowadays, right? And it's only accelerating. This is something that is just going to keep happening. The world is going to keep accelerating. There's going to be new technology. There's going to be new things. There's always, there's always going to be something that you can trade, right? And this is going to only increase, in my opinion. Um, you're going to have sectors that are going to come up that you couldn't even think of. There's a shitload of money to be made in anything. As long as you just don't go completely retarded, gamble everything away and do dumb shit, right? Like as long as you keep money and make money on the way, you can trade, right? But if you do dumb shit and you're like, hey, I missed the Solana trade, so I'm going to throw all my money into this and that coin. And if it doesn't go up, oh, well, um, I think that's the wrong attitude you have because there's always going to be the next Solana trade. But I... If, from let me tell you from experience like if you don't have money or not enough money and this is something that's happened to me before where at a low i was like i wish i could buy like a zero more you know what i mean like 10 times as much as i'm buying right now but i just yes. cannot afford it and the reason for that is because i did dumb shit before right and this is something that i think is quite important and it's something that people just kind of very very much disregard nowadays with their whole like this is the same the same reason why people held gme and whatever they're like this is the only way that i can i can make it but there's a, a million ways that you can make it as long as you can like put yourself in the position that you have the, the chance to and that also means that you don't just completely go retarded uh, in my opinion sometimes it's okay Sometimes you just go like a little bit wild, but never like just risk everything um, because if you're out of the game, you're out of the game. And um, then you cannot take advantage of all of these situations that are going to come up. And I can promise you that there's going to be a shitload of, like, of, of Solana trades. There's going to be a shitload of things like that in crypto, but there's also going to be a shitload of things like that anywhere you look in the next 50, 100 years just based on the fact how fast the world is getting now and how much faster it's going to get. So, yeah, don't fuck yourself over by being dumb. Use your brain at least a little and don't just kind of risk everything at all all turns because you can, and I've seen a bunch of people risk everything like five times in a row and made it big, but you can only do that for so long. So, yeah. Sorry, I was busy buying inscriptions and meme coins. What did you say? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, yeah. think, I think that's right. That That's grounded and reasonable. And also, just this is almost as a finishing point, never underestimate how quickly sentiment shifts in crypto, even with relatively small price movements. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, shit... you see it in the ETH. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you can see it in the ETH chart. But that shit catches up to you so fucking quickly. And yeah, the, like the market doesn't need to move that much or you know even just a couple of fucking red candles and suddenly your your feed will be flooded with well of course there were all these obvious froth signals and you should have taken profit and i'm going to buy back with some ridiculous target like a lot of the social media side is more or less cheerleading and sort of momentum chasing and that yep. that's not helpful if you're trying to do this thing with some foresight we literally went from there's not going to be another crypto cycle to and solana is a dead scam chain to we're going to all time high infinity once ETF kicks in and you know 100k BTC 200k BTC etc and you know Solana's the best thing and meme their fucking phone is being sold out so people could get a meme coin airdrop. You Dude, know? They're selling for five thousand euros. Unreal, but that that's the center. And and look, how long did that sentiment shift take from no new cycle to this? Like a few months, realistically. Like yes. that that's insane. You can go from extreme to extreme in a number of months, and you just don't don't see that anywhere else.
And that's also why I roll my eyes every time, Don, you say some shit like, oh, well, I could see us chopping for six years. It's like, fuck you. No one's chopping for six years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it depends on, on the, 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 fr- the range we're chopping in, you know? Yes, but we'll you chop can... between zero and 200k for, for the next <laughs> 50 years or whatever. Yeah, I mean, but then again, like, if you think about it, we've been chopping for a thousand and a hundred days ish now. We? Yeah. Like, That's... if you just if you just go back to the, the 4th of January, like, where we technically entered this range that we're currently trading in, it's oh, been a thousand one hundred days. Are you British by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> Why? The, you know, this is this is the this is our national sport. It's range trading. And, oh yeah, and, uh, <laughs> no, I get it. Yeah, oof, oof, that's that's a low blow, bro. <laughs> what calling you British? <laughs> I mean, fair enough. Shit. <laughs> I think we've also spoken about this topic before. It's like, well, you know, I, I unequivocally use like auction market theory oriented range trading whatever principles in my own trading. Um, and I, th- I think they work and they're reasonable and they're they're based a lot of the time, the sort of underlying market effect they're trying to map is based on sort of market microstructure and things that actually work like, you know, order clustering, order herding, uh, all of this type of shit. And it, it's a completely fine system. Um, but a lot of the time the disproportionate returns are in crypto and the large outsized moves will come from trending environments and trending moves. So even if you're, so, and I've already said on previous episodes, that was like a clear weakness in my system in the past, where if the market would shift into like a very shallow pullback, uh, very strong trending set of conditions, like my system would 100% underperform. And so I've like worked actively to make that better. You can find tweets and threads and system stuff, etc. cetera. Uh, but if you're in crypto and your sort of dominant approach is to view everything in that lens, I don't know how useful that is. You know, like it'll obviously outperform when the market is choppy and ranging, etc. But then the s- secondary question is, how many of your net lifetime returns in crypto are made in range bound versus trending conditions? You can also ask the question of, in general, what what's the expected value of catching a trend in crypto versus trading a range well in crypto? And I think at the very least, the answer to those aren't clear. My inclination is that the trending stuff uh, will, at, at least returns wise, can offer more. So if you don't have a system that can cater to the, like this style of market, I think you're kind of shortchanging yourself from some of the better price action in crypto. And people love to be fucking dramatic about this and say, oh, you're calling out XYZ system, person, etc. It's not that at all. This is, I've highlighted my own personal plight with this uh, to, it, to, you know, to, to whatever extent is appropriate. But I just think like if you're choosing this market because of like volatility and trends, you should have a system that is at least somewhat commensurate with volatility and trends and if everything is always in like range bound conditions or in a range i think you can make it work like for example if you if your range is between 30k and 60k btc then as the market moves from range low to range high it sounds like you're being like some sort of range head when the market's obviously trending but the difference between 30k and 60k is so fucking big that the move from range low to range high in the grand scheme is a trending move right so there's obviously all sorts of fucking nuances that get into it uh, but, you know, there's always, obviously going to be someone listening for whom this is their first, like, proper, like, looking at Solana, looking at some of these other altcoins where they just trend and don't do anything else. Uh, I would say don't shy away from it like I did for the first year or two and actually lean into it and see what kind of systems uh, you can build or how you can adjust your trading style to at least give you entries or give you trading opportunities on those. Because if you stick to, like, super conservative, high time frame swing uh, consolidation based trading. It's fine. It works. There's definitely an edge there. Uh, but for all you know, if you haven't tried the other one, you have no way of knowing if it's, uh, you know, your preferred approach or even uh, the best way of doing things. There's like a random, uh, you know, not to diss either my, my own system or any of my British friends. I, I think it's a completely reasonable, viable way of trading, uh, but it's not the only way. And I think a system that can adapt and at least give you a chance to make money on trending moves so you don't feel like super out of your depth. Uh, is a useful thing. The, the the anecdote that I keep coming back to in my own experience is that when I first started learning like FX related horizontal support resistance, you know, Trader Dante stuff in 2017, like early 2017, crypto just started trending. And I it was trending so hard and the trends were so vertical, I literally thought that I was just like misunderstanding how to draw a horizontal line. 
So I was like, well, this market doesn't have any levels. What do you mean level? It just keeps going up. Uh, and that was like a very fucking sobering experience as to how not all trading methodologies apply to all sets of market conditions. If you learn one thing and it's worked uh, up until now, you know, we, we've chopped for fucking ages. And if you got comfortable there, that's great. Remember that, use that. There will be periods where it's useful. If anything, the market more often ranges than trends. So that should be your bread and butter. But I would say avoid the mistake that I made and you should investigate some time into like lower time frame trend following stuff because in crypto that's there's a lot of opportunity there i don't know if you agree with that no i totally agree the the only problem with that like with the whole thing is basically that people switch from one to the other at the worst possible <laughs> yeah, time yeah it's Always. hard man it's hard yeah i mean it is i but like i i do remember when people told me like why the fuck are you holding your like bitcoin trade that i opened at 16k still like did you not learn that you need to like close your positions early in right. this kind of market but it's like it depends you know like it, it, for example in my opinion it's much much better to have the the that whole like okay i need to close close and open my positions quickly on trade the ranges and whatever when the market has been ranging for quite a uh, when the market has been like running for quite a while because it's more likely to get choppy but it's very hard to time this, right? Yes. And for some reason, what people do is they trade the ranges until the market goes completely ballistic. And then they're like, hey, I, I need to change this because I'm not catching as much upside as the other people are. And the moment you actually start changing it, you get screwed over. So this is something that I've seen sadly too much. Um, but it's also really, really hard because for me, it's also like I I, I struggle with this too. Like I, I oftentimes round tip and... Uh, round trip positions uh, if you remember back um on the way down i was like i i opened positions a couple times and i was like okay i'm like i bought and then it bounced like 10 15 percent and then i round tripped a large part of the, the the gains just because i was like hey i wanna i wanna have the position if this actually turns into something so there's ups and downsides to both um it's just like if you switch at a bad time uh, you're gonna get extra wrecked and then you're even less likely to to switch and stay with that new thing so for example if you've been range trading and you've been like completely mad that you've not been catching like the outsized gains right now i think if you switch to trend trading right now i think you're a little bit late uh, and there's a good chance that your range trading would do better uh, in these kind of in these kind of environments but I, it, it depends. It also depends on what you're trading. If you're trading all coins, they can range. Uh, they can run a little bit longer. I think just on Bitcoin, it's been ranging. So this shit's hard, man. You know, yeah, it's, it's really, like, it's really like, hard. I think it's the hardest part. Yeah, I think it's the hardest part about trading to kind of realize whether you should be holding onto positions yes. or not. Like it's literally, I think, the hardest part. Like in identifying trading. the regime and then adjusting to what you perceive to be regime changes. That that's yeah. that's money, but it's also the hardest yeah. part. Yeah, fuck yeah. that. Um, because think, now in hindsight it looks so easy right like i, yeah. I bought six i bought 16k it was the pico bottom and people are like why the fuck did you not hold to 44 50 60 100k but if you remember back when i bought 16k and it went to 20 people were like secure profits like you're being an idiot yeah. so it's like it, it always like it's hard it's really hard just move to break even <laughs> yeah uh, it's, uh, that's the most that's the worst worst advice um sometimes it works sometimes, yeah. early bull if market. you have a great entry it works i think yeah. right that's kind of the whole point where if you have like a really good entry that the market has no business revisiting then i can sort of understand the break even stop but even then i'm not like a huge fan uh yeah. maybe if you're taking like super gambly punty positions that you shouldn't have taken in the first place and you're like i don't know if i want to keep this exposure i want to kind of give it a chance but i know i don't have a, a, a huge edge here then from a balancing point of view it kind of makes sense to move to break even but in general if you're buying like if your thesis for example is you're buying support and then it bounces a little bit and you move to break even well then you're ready to sell support at that point by definition yep. like literally by definition and the same works for uh resistance like if you sell resistance it moves a little bit and you move your stop to break even that means you're willing to buy at resistance and so it becomes completely circular and antithetical to your to your trade idea so yeah. there's all sorts it's, of fucking nuances of this shit oh I think yeah one of people the, people always say it's easy like no, it's, it's the funniest really. thing like it is easy when you're right it's really <laughs> yes, hard no. when you're wrong <laughs> that's oh, just how man, it goes that's, that's such a good summary i completely agree with that um i think even in a range trading context if you want to make it more trend like 
one thing that I've picked up from just doing these fucking shows and newsletters with you over, over a lot of time is that in certain points, you have to make bets that the next resistance or the next support, if you're bearish, but just for the bullish example, that the next resistance or the first trouble area is going to break. Yeah. And that's when you can really start to hold on to your winners more and uh, turn it into something that looks a bit more trendy, at least in terms of capturing the size of the move. Uh, the extreme version of that is when you see like people with, you know, it's like a 5% range and they've got fucking 10 levels on it. And it's like, bro, this is completely untradeable. Like even just, even if you traded the range perfectly, just with fees, <laughs> you're like barely <laughs> yep. breaking even at that point. So I, I think, mean, the, the person yeah. that taught you this and gave you the ref link is making a lot of money though. In, in that instance, I mean, it certainly incentivizes that type of participation, which, you know, mi mixed results type of thing. But if you have a system that like gives you good entries and within the sort of, you know, more conservative level to level type of framework is working, but your trading journal tells you that, you know, if you, your average cut, you, you know, on average, you close the trade for like, I don't know, 1.5 R, uh, but then on it keeps running to an average of, let's say, three or four before reversing. Then you can kind of look into it and say, well, what is it about those trade setups uh, that mean that the wherever I wanted to take profit ends up either being a good place to compound slash enter or why that resistance breaks. And then over time, you can start curating a system where you turn into into you turn into like a fucking uh, pantomime of casual Friday, where it's like, Don, what do you think of this resistance? It's like, well, I don't think it's going to hold. And then, you know, I sell it, I get fucking carried out and then the ma ma market magically breaks it. Uh, I do think that's probably the lowest hanging, just to make it somewhat practically useful for the audience instead of us pontificating. Uh, the mm -hmm. uh, lowest hanging fruit when it comes to adjusting a conservative range bound level to level trading system to make it more trend like without transforming it completely is to find a set of instances or group of setups where you can rationally justify ignoring the first level of resistance and holding it to the level after that or even after that that that's probably you know the the easiest way to start uh positioning for larger moves and obviously as soon as you try it's going to go terribly like, like you'll ignore the resistance that you'd normally sell and then it ends up being the Pico top on your round trip. But like over time with experience with the trading journal and whatever edges you have, uh, your trading system, even if it's conservative, should give you some indication as to whether you can hold through the first uh, level of resistance or not. I think, I mean, that's how I started anyway. So yeah, if like that's it. worth anything to anyone. If there's anything I like, it's saying... Yeah, that's resistance, but, but fuck <laughs> it's it. got a break. It's pretty yeah. empowering, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I love it. And the thing is, like, if you're right, and this is the thing, like, because a lot of people see the same resistance that you see, right? So if it teleport, like, it, if it, if you're right and it's going to break, it's going to teleport. Uh, and that's where you get the outsized kind of candles and the outsized returns. But obviously, you also take on a bunch of risk. But uh, I mean, there's no trading without taking on risk. So sometimes you just have to bite the bullet. And this goes back to the point of like, um having the stop loss at break even like sometimes you just have to be man enough to be like hey i'm gonna lose money on this if i'm yeah. wrong and i think the attitude of i i cannot lose money um is a very wrong one in trading like you have to be able to say hey if my idea is wrong i'm gonna lose money and that's okay because that's literally all trading is like you risk your money to make more and if you're wrong you're gonna get shit on and that's something that you have to have to be able to um to deal with and if you're not um you shouldn't be trading so yeah i think it was don't. gottfried leibniz that said scared money don't make money ho. <laughs> and you know exactly. he's a big philosophical influence so um yep. I'll, I'll, we'll leave you with his wisdom we're not going to do the fucking news don because there isn't no. that much and we've been rambling for way too long and i'm sure most reasonable people checked out and we started sucking our own dicks about buying btc at 4k so god god bless those people yes. um i did have the casual Friday stuff I wanted to mention was the liquidators. 3C estimate is 46%. Phantom adding support for Bitcoin. And Solana Saga phone uh, sells for $5,000, which is a bit frothy. And then Dog with Hat making it to Bloomberg. Uh, yeah, altcoins, yeah. the Solana, I mean, altcoins are frothy. I don't give a fuck. Like, they can keep going. And uh, I'm sure there are short-term trades there. And sometimes the blow-off portion is the most volatile and profitable one. You know, terms and conditions apply. Results may vary and shit. But like old coins are frothy, I think uh, beyond frothy. Like, yeah, what would you want me to mean, say, man? <laughs> this is twenty twenty one froth levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like open interest wise and altcoin dominance by volume wise, and yeah. So fuck it. 
we're gonna end the show there. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> we we've been all over the place, man. The news usually kind of you know guides us to a warmer place, and then suddenly we went onto tangents about like regime shifts and trading and fucking break even stops and how to adjust your system. So maybe it's just a good time to shut the fuck up and go do some Christmas preparations and stuff. Yeah. Um. I, it's just a, it's just because we did it in the morning, you know. Like, that's true. We have too much energy. That's bad. Yeah. We need to do it at like I, 10 p.m. when you're fucking sleepy as fuck. Like, dog, what do you think? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but I, I you cannot say I have too much energy because I'm running empty, dude. That's true. It's been I've been waking up like ten times a night for the last three weeks. So, oh god, uh, yeah, you, it's it's is, been something. Is your is your wife not helping? Uh, <laughs> I mean, she is. She's doing most of it. It's just like if the baby cries, I'm gonna wake up whether she takes it or That's not. True. Baby gets so. a two in one, hey. Oh yeah, yeah. She's she's our little terrorist, is what we call her. <laughs> it's very loving. I hope social services appreciate the job there. <laughs> yes, in a loving way. In a loving, a loving terrorist. I, I, yeah. Dude, I made I might made a nine eleven joke out of it today. So like I, I'm done. Oh nice, yeah. <laughs> But what what is it with Friday casual Fridays and nine eleven? I made like a I Binance nine eleven reference, and now you there's, there's I don't know, man. The amount of watch lists we're already on slash are going to be added yeah. to. Oh, I'm, I, yeah, if we were American, we'd be in jail already. <laughs> Should we cut this? As in the show, <laughs> not this portion. This portion's staying. Like fuck it. <laughs> Yeah, we should end it on that, though. It doesn't get better. 100%. Also, we always get super bear-tarded in the final five minutes of Casual Friday, have you noticed? It's like, by the way, altcoins are frothy, ETF is sell the news, 2024 good news catalyst are priced in, fuck you, see you next week. Have a good weekend. <laughs> it's like, okay, I guess, thanks. <laughs> I mean, dude, it's it's just because, like, the, the, the prior parts of the show, you're trying to be like, yeah, but it could go up, could go down, <laughs> that. <laughs> but when you have to bring it to a point, you're just like, yeah, I mean, this is just this is not it's not the greatest. Um, and then you just slam it. But fuck's sake. But it could go up. It, it, it I mean, could, it could, it go, could up. go up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, totally. Oh god. Strong, what is it? Strong opinions loosely held or some shit? Exactly. That's our, Listen, that's our if it goes up, we'll just crop the bits where we said it could go up. If it goes down, we'll just crop the bits where we said it could go down. There's there's uh, no losing here. This is social media after all. Yeah. I mean, you gotta get a game with the times, you know. Yes, use our ref link, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Right, well, that's that's it. the show. That's that's the show. Uh, we will do an episode of Casual Friday next week, which is going to be our big post Christmas New Year summary reflections. If you have like ideas for something fun slash special, we should do for that. Maybe like a hot tub stream or something. Uh, let us know in the comments. Ideally, some more reasonable ideas. But if it's a hot tub stream, it's a hot tub stream. Uh, otherwise. <laughs> Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you to Wu for supporting the show or whatever this thing is. Uh, links available in the description. The trading competition is still going on. Uh, Don isn't trading it, so you can get go get on the leaderboard and kick some ass. Uh, unless you're competing in the lowest ROI category, in which case uh, the prizes are already in my possession. Hope you'll have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you next week and Merry Christmas. And, you know, we've had a very lucky and fortunate year in crypto. Uh, hasn't been the case for, you know, the world in general, cost of living crisis, uh, the German bread lines that Don was telling us about while buying BTC. Um, so if you're in a position to help someone or just be kind in general and spread some of the spread and share some of the love, wealth or whatever it is, even if it's yeah, your send time. it our way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Take those gains and eat them on fucking WooX, you little bitch. <laughs> oh, man, I was almost going somewhere wholesome with that. And then you were like, <laughs> Gib. No, but I, I agree. It's like, if you I change mean... your life, change ours too. <laughs> the fucking tip jar is in the description. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Oh, good old times when people still had tip jars. Um, Dude, I did that shit and I got like a hundred bucks after teaching TA to like most people on Twitter now when they were just oh, starting yeah. out. Yeah, that sounded very like, self-indulgent and it's completely unlike me, but but I've decent grounds to believe that it's an accurate, like a factually accurate statement. It is actually. I mean, I just know like most of the people that are coming up now on, on Twitter started with, with something like that. And, and to I them, mean, I apologize <laughs> for wasting <laughs> your time with dog shit RSI videos. Oh no, I, I think it's a good place to start. So yeah. Great. Yeah. Fuck it. We already are. To, dude, we keep trying to resuscitate this thing. We like end it and then the fucking, what are those things called? The, God, defibrillators, you know, like yeah, zap yeah, it back to life. And then this back, animated yeah. corpse of a show walks around for five more minutes. <laughs> well, let's end it then. Let's end it. Okay. Woo. Reffling. Give Don money. Castles. Crying babies. Thank you. See you next week. Bye.